I'm a philosopher by trade, so I write and I speak on particularly applying principles of practical ethics to everyday life. I don't do politics as a, as a major thing. I'm not being paid to be here to, to write up my comments. Um, and in 2008 and 2010, I worked with Ari Armstrong, who's right there on this, against the, the personhood um, ballot measures. And um, I think it's important to note, Ari and I were not just looking to defeat the ballot measures. We thought that would happen, particularly after the first one went down in flames. We thought the second one would go down in flames, too. But we, we were wanting to conduct a kind of broader educational campaign, but because we were doing that around the ballot measure, because that was a good news hook for us, basically, we got caught up in all of these campaign, campaign finance laws, or actually I did, because Ari refused to have anything to do, to do with them. Um, and our efforts were severely, severely hampered by Colorado's campaign, campaign finance laws. And unfortunately, pretty much none of the rule changes are going to fix that for me in 2012. The only one that would really make a difference is the $5,000 limit, um, which is, I know, in litigation, and I really hope you, win, hope you win that case, but I don't think that'll happen in time for, for 2012, or at least I don't know what the timeline is, but these things take, take forever. But I do really, I do, in, for the most part, with, with one major exception, I really do support these rule changes. I think they will be helpful for people like me who are part-time activists, who are just trying to figure out what the heck we need to do so that we don't lose our shirts in a, in a lawsuit or with fines. Um, and so what I want to do is I'd like to just briefly recount my experiences because nobody here has talked yet about what it's like as a regular, ordinary citizen activist to comply with these laws and how difficult it is. And then I want to talk about, if, if it's okay, some of the rule changes that I, that I um, think are really important and then this one that I, I think is um, a big problem. So in 2008, Ari and I wrote a policy paper against Amendment 48, which was the personhood amendment. Um, I published it under the auspices of the Coalition for Secular Government, which was then and still is now really just me and a blog. And um, Ari and I, we wrote this paper without compensation and I spent a few hundred dollars of my own personal money to promote it. Now, I was only by happenstance, I found out that I would be subject to these campaign finance rules and this was oddly, if I had written the paper alone, I don't think I would have, but it was because I co-authored it with somebody who was not my husband, that therefore I, I was subject to all of a sudden to all of these campaign finance rules. Now, what I did was I, I printed out a bunch of copies of, these, of this paper. I went to Office Max and bought some envelopes and labels and stuff like that. I went to the post office and I bought postage and made photocopies at the UPS store. And I spent um, just actually just under $200 on, on office supplies in doing this and I mailed out the thing. This was essential to my free speech was that I was trying to promote what Ari and I had written. It wasn't enough for, for us to write this thing and let it sit in the closet, right? We wanted, we wanted to get this paper out there. Well, it was such a hassle to file this report where I had to list, you know, list all the names and addresses. Like, who cares what post office I bought stamps at? Who cares which UPS store I did the photocopies at? But you guys, not you, but I'm not personally, right? But the state needed to know um, where, you know, which UPS store I had used. And it was just so much trouble that I, I decided I will not spend any more money to promote this paper anymore. I, I had had it, that was it. Now in 2010, um, I had had this kind of, uh, blissful memory blank about all these campaign finance rules. And so when I, when I, Ari and I, we made our plans to substantially revise and expand the paper. And what we wanted to do this time was instead of working for free, which kind of sucks, we wanted to actually get paid for our work. And so we had a lot of people who supported our position on this, mostly friends of ours who were willing to contribute to pledge to have this paper, um, to have this paper written and published. And they, they, um, it was, it was a total of 63 pledges ranging from $4 to $300 for a grand total of $2,695. This is not a big amount to be spending. Um, and these people, and I think this is really important to note, these people were exercising their free speech rights in donating to us, right? These were people who were wanting us to speak for them. They were telling us, Ari and Diana, you two represent our opinions. We want our opinions out there and we want to pool our resources and help you be more effective in advocating, advocating your views because those are our views too. Well, of course, because of this, I was well over the $200 threshold, and I was appalled to find out that I had to report their names and addresses, as well as their occupation and their employer if it was over $100. It was names and addresses if it's over $20. Um, and I was, I was really, really upset by this, and I considered abandoning the project entirely. Um, I, was, I was upset that I was going to have to file all these reports. That was going to be very burdensome for me. It was going to take away time that I could have used to, to spend promoting the paper. Um, I thought that my contributors were entitled to privacy. This is, abortion is a really controversial topic, and I didn't think that somebody who, 
who donate just because they donated $21 that anybody was entitled to know their home address. Um, and then I was particularly, particularly concerned about fines and violations, about not doing the paperwork correctly, which was really, really difficult for me to do. I'm a smart person, I've got a PhD, but you know, filling out, filling out this kind of, I'm trying to understand the rules and then filling out all the paperwork and doing this pretty much you know, on, a, on a moment's notice without consulting a lawyer, which I couldn't afford to do, was, was not insignificant. I was really worried about it. And I don't know to this day I, I mean, I don't know, can somebody, can somebody raise a problem from a, from a past report? I don't know, every time I think about it, I get, I get nervous, I get agitated. And I think, thinking about 2012, where I'm hoping to raise more money, I just, the legal risk is enormous, and I'm really concerned, I'm really concerned about that. Is it more than 180 days ago? It is, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> Good. Good. But really, like, I don't know that. I mean, I think I know more than 99.9% .9 of Colorado residents about our campaign finance laws. I mean, as, a, as an average citizen, I'm pretty well informed. But holy cow, there's so much that I don't know. And so the fact that I don't, like, I don't know that because I, I mean, just reading through even these rule changes is work that I am not it's enthused about doing, <laughs> right? It's, it's, not, it's not my area. It's not my specialty. Um, now I do think all the whole this whole structure of campaign finance laws in Colorado absolutely violates free speech rights. Free speech means that people are entitled to advocate their views, to express them uh, without forcible interference from government or anybody else, including their political opponents. Uh, free speech also means that people are entitled to join together and pool their resources so that they can they can send they can get their message place their message out in the marketplace more effectively. But these things are not permitted in Colorado election politics. Um, we, we the people, were not entitled to join together to express our views um, unless we register with the government, submit regular reports disclosing minute details of our finances, and if we fail to do that or if we make some trivial error, we can be dragged into court and subject to hundreds or thousands of dollars of fines well beyond our ability to pay. And so basically this means we don't have free speech in Colorado elections. What we have is free speech with government permission. If we, if we jump through all the hoops, if we can afford to do all of these things, then we're, then we're permitted by the government to speak. Now, obviously, I think that all of these campaign finance laws need to be overturned, but in the meantime, since that's definitely not, um, not within your purview, um, I want to talk about some of, the, some of the rule changes that I do think would make things easier, that would make things better, although, honestly, I still, every time I'm going to have to fill out a report, I'm going to be cursing pretty much whoever I, whoever I possibly can. So one is the definition of an, of an issue committee. So as I, I, I did testify in May in favor of raising the threshold to $5,000, I still support that. I think it should be significantly higher, but $5,000 is way better than, than $2,000. Um, uh, on the major purpose test, um, I think people have raised some, some genuine issues here about using the 30% as a threshold. I liked Ari's suggestion of doing either a dollar amount or 30%, you know, let's say whatever, whichever you hit first or something like that. Um, but I do like the idea that there's a clear rule here. There hasn't been a test at all. Who knows what a major purpose would mean? And so it means that if you decide not to file, you're running the risk that you're going to be dragged into court and then you, ha then you have to prove that it's not a major purpose to a judge or whoever it is um, that's, that's looking at your case. And you just don't you don't know whether you're complying with the rules or not. This would at least have a bright line test, which would be good. Um, I'm confused, though, as to why, and I just noticed this in the discussion today, why a major purpose is 50% for political committees and 30% for issue committees. Um, I don't know why there's the difference. I'd rather have 50% for issue for issue committees too. Why not? Have, what those? I would assume those tests should be the should be the same. And I, of course, for the sake of free speech, rather than have it be the, the higher test. Um, one interesting thing, though, one thing that hasn't been brought up about this test is I actually don't know how we could possibly apply it to our case. Um, Ari and I are going to be, for the 2012 election season, we're going to be working again on the, on the personhood ballot measure in Colorado. But personhood spread, these personhood measures have spread all over the country. There's multiple states that are, are considering them. There's, of course, the broader anti-abortion movement that we're dealing with. There's, there's our unique defense of abortion rights that we're giving. And so, what, like, let's say we write a policy paper, what, how do we calculate like, what amount of our, sp and, and the policy paper concerns Colorado and what's going on, let's say, in Ohio and Oregon and uh, some other states and then nationally. How do we decide if, let's say, we're spending money to promote that paper, whether 30% more or less is for the Colorado ballot measure? 
And, and I think this is a general problem for an issue committee like us, whereby we're using the, the ballot measure as a kind of news hook for a broader advocacy effort. Right? So we're here in Colorado, we're concerned with this issue, and it's a great opportunity for us to advocate our views because of the ballot measure, but our purpose is not just to defeat the ballot measure. We're, again, we're pretty sure it's going to get defeated. Um, I mean, we, we want people to vote against it. We want people, more people to vote against it this time. But we don't have any way of, there, there's no way of applying this rule to a case in which we're looking, we're looking more broadly. We've got a bigger, a bigger kind of ideological agenda than just defeating this ballot measure. Um, okay, so that's, but again, I do support the rule, at least for many groups, it will be a bright, a bright line test. Um, privacy, nobody has talked about this. I think this is really, really fantastic. You have in, um, oh, I don't have it written down. I think it's, oh, proposed rule 20. So basically, by the current rules, everybody has to submit their personal information if it's over the threshold, you know, $20 for, for name and address and $100 for, um, uh, for occupation and employer. And I was really concerned about this. I called the Secretary of State's office in 2010 about this, saying, look, I don't want to have to release the names and addresses of my contributors on, on an abortion issue. I know that there has been violence perpetrated against defenders of, of, defenders of abortion rights by anti-abortion activists. I didn't want people to be subject to either violence or harassment. And so this, this new rule would allow people who fear for their own safety or fear for their family's safety to, to ask, request the Secretary of State that that information be redacted and it couldn't be discovered by, by other processes. I think, that's, I think that's a good option. I would like to see it more brought up because I, I think that safety is, is too high of a bar here. I think people can have good reasons for wanting to speak anonymously or support causes anonymously, not, but not just because they fear that, that they're going to get their head chopped off. Um, I think that, that people oftentimes, let's say they might want to avoid unpleasant conflicts with their coworkers, with their family, with their neighbors. If your neighbor is a judge and you're, and you're donating to his, the, the, the campaign to defeat him, if you're donating to Clear the Bench Colorado, you, know, you just might not have such neighborly relations after that. And I think that people have reasons for, for wanting to have anonymous speech, and I think that's, that's a, it should be a right of theirs, and if it can't be a right because of our campaign finance laws, um, perhaps the, the Secretary of State's office can do something to allow for broader concerns than, than simply safety in that rule. Um, penalties and waivers. Um, I'm really happy to see these changes. This has been one of my greatest fears about speaking out is unknown, who knows what happens with, with penalties and a kind of unknown process of waivers. I, I looked back at the 2010 manual and basically it just says that, that you guys can, grant, or you can grant waivers or reductions at your discretion using good cause, and that's all that it says. But I really like the idea that there's clear standards for here's what counts as a good cause, here's what doesn't count as a good cause, here's what we're going to do for a first time, a second time, and, and having increased penalties for that, making a difference between deliberate deception in terms of failing to report versus um, uh, you know, just, just ordinary errors. Um, and then, um, and I do also think I really, I mean, I don't know about the, your authority to do this, right? That's not, that's not my issue. but. Um, I, I think that the, the limit of $50 per day per report for 180 days is a really good one. $9,000, that is a huge fine. It is not something that I would be eager to pay in any way, shape, or form. Um, it would be well beyond the means of my organization, but at least that's better than infinitely accruing, accruing fines. Um, uh, so the fourth thing, and this is where I, I turn to my sole objection, and this was, this was raised very early in, the, in this discussion. Um, was basically, it's, this is on the aggregating contributions and expenditures. So by the current rules, contributions of $20 or more must be itemized, including the name and address. Um, and the rules don't say any more than that, so I could get multiple $19 donations and I don't have to report those, the person's name and address. But by, by rule 10.1, basically all these, these contributions have to be aggregated for a given reporting period, and so I need to, if I'm over $20 from a particular source, then I have to, I have to submit their name address. Now, I think this is a real problem because it does mean I'm going to have to start collecting personal data from everybody who contributes. The person who contributes a dollar, I don't know whether they're going to contribute enough dollars to the reporting period that I'm going to have to track, you know, track every single dollar rather than just having a single bright line of saying, okay, at, at $20, now I have to collect your, your name and address. So it really, it, it really is going to increase the burdens on me, particularly people who are doing more grassroots advocacy where you're collecting less less money from people. If I get $500 from a person, 
I know that I have to report them no matter what, but it's these small donations that a lot of us rely on that, that won't be possible here. Um, and I, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the rule change. I understand why you're doing it. It seems like a loophole, right? It seems like this is, this is on, you know, allowing people to get away with these multiple, multiple donations. Um, but I think that closing this loophole means imposing much more burdens on, on speakers and as well on, on contributors. Because if you're a contributor, you're going to have to submit your personal information every time. And presumably that information could be discovered in a lawsuit. So basically, you're eliminating the possibility of anonymous contributions. Um, uh, and then I do think, and this, this was also mentioned in the prior testimony, this is just ripe for political shenanigans and that's a, a too nice of a word, uh, malicious lawsuits. Basically, where, where somebody, somebody goes and, and donates small amounts, perhaps does some of them anonymously, and then comes back and says, my name wasn't on that report, and I'm gonna file a lawsuit. And I'm, things like that have happened, and I know that, that in 2008, the, um, somebody on the left specifically filed a lawsuit against Christy Burton so as to shut her up in the campaign, so as to silence her, so as to waste her time. And so the idea that that, that wouldn't happen, um, I think, is is unfortunately not true. Um, uh, so I think that's that's a rule change that I'm really concerned about. I think I think you should simply allow the current rule, which is which is that if you only have to report if a given contribution is twenty dollars or more. And I don't think there's any need to any need to change that. Um, so basically, I I. I'm, I am in support of these rules, even though they're not going to make a huge difference for me. So, I'm supposed to track every penny, so I shouldn't ever pass the hat, right? I shouldn't, I mean, not that I'm not actually holding local events, but I shouldn't, and so I actually do know my that contributors, would be correct. but, but correct. you should never ever pass it. You should know where every dollar comes from. Should you know that person's name and address? Um, the answer is yes. I just, you know, I, what's it's, the point of speaking out in Colorado's elections? I mean, it just, it's so frustrating. It's, and sorry, I am getting upset, but it's just, <laughs> it's, it's, I want to be able to talk about this issue, and I want to be able to talk about it in, in a time when the news media is interested in it, which means at election season, and to have to go through all of this, it's just unbelievable. Like, what happened to free speech? Um. I know, that's sorry, a broader that was a debate. Question, um, <laughs> let me let me ask you one one last question. You, um, I mean, you test and we had this a similar discussion. You testified at length in um, the earlier rulemaking with the issue right. committee enforcement threshold. Um, do you want to incorporate your testimony into this rulemaking? Um, I I did actually incorporate that. I have the, at least my history. Um, I, I have that in my written comments. So okay. Yeah. So that's available. My full my full gory detail of what it was like to to comply with these laws is in my in my written testimony. So. Great. Thank you very much. Can, can I uh, I just want to make a clarification on Rule 20. So Rule 20 doesn't actually allow you as the filer as the committee. Right. It's the person. It's has the to request. it's the person. The person has to request the right. redaction. So you can't as a filer ask for a right. blanket redaction or even a specific redaction of a particular. Um, co contributor, you you have to have them do that. So I just okay. wanted to make sure. That yeah, yeah, that was which means you know again it means more paperwork for something that that people ought, people shouldn't have to risk life and limb to support political cause. I wouldn't think so. Yeah, or file bureaucratic paperwork. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you.